Terrestrial vertebrates are all tetrapods, four-legged, but terrestrial invertebrates can have six, eight, ten, or more. What is it about having an internal skeleton that limited ancestral terrestrial vertebrates, vertebrates to evolving only four limbs? So that's, I, I love this question. Um, and I, um, I, I have sort of a kind of a mechanistic answer. And I'm not, sh I, I feel like I would like to spend a week or so talking with people about this rather than trying to do something kind of, kind of off the top of my head. What, what are you looking at? Well, I'm trying, I'm thinking back through the phylogeny and trying to figure out how much we're going to foist off onto historical constraint and how much we've got a mechanistic reason. They're, they look like they're, they sound like they're looking for a mechanistic explanation. I'm just trying to. Well, w one, one of the levels of mechanism has to do with Hox genes. Yep. Um, so there's this, there's a big class of, of genes called homeobox genes within which um, is, a, is a category of genes called Hox genes. Sometimes those are conflated. Actually, often they're conflated. In fact, I found a paper by two you know, well-respected um, biologists today in which they, you know, often they'll say like Hox, parentheses homeobox or the inverse, but no, like Hox is a subset of homeobox and Hox genes specifically are involved in basically um, um, repeating segments on the anterior posterior axis. And so in, in vertebrates, you basically have an axial skeleton and axis, sort of three skeletons developmentally. You've got an axial skeleton, a cranial skeleton, and then an appendicular skeleton, the, uh, the uh, appendices. Um, and exactly as the discord people are, are positing, we've got two girdles. We've got two appendicular um, girdles, the um, pectoral girdle up here, off which come our arms, and the pelvic girdle, off which come our legs. And that's actually highly conserved across all, all vertebrates. Um, there are no, you, you, when you get repeats, when you get um, repeats that don't belong in the Hox genes in vertebrates um, at the you know sort of appendicular girdle level um, those those hopeful monsters don't survive right they aren't they aren't that hopeful um, but there it does seem to me that there's something about the um, the the more repeats that are already in the arthropod skeleton i don't know if it's going to be an internal versus external skeleton thing per se but the fact that there are just already more repeats um and so the sort of you know at each at each of the segments off an arthropod skeleton um you can kind of do a repeat that involves legs um or or not uh and uh you know so there i sort of fizzle out without having spent a lot more time digging back into the evo devo stuff that I at once kind of knew, but also I think we don't fully understand, you know, like the anterior posterior axis, Hox genes deal with repeats, but you know, what more than that? Yeah. Um, I have to say, I don't have a good fix on this. There is something about the arthropods with their many segments that there are bound to be simple rules for animating those segments. Yeah. In other words, simple yeah, yeah. patterns. And in fact, uh, those of us who have experimented with robot building hmm. find that you can, you know, you can create uh, an insect or a spider and that, you know, it's not so hard to figure out a pattern that actually produces locomotion. Yeah. Um, and there's something about the fact of the vertebrates being more software flexible so the mm -hmm, pattern mm -hmm. that functions to produce locomotion um, is something that can be partially acquired. Now, obviously, a horse locomotes pretty well at birth. Um, a person does not. Uh, so how much flexibility there needs to be is a question. But I'm wondering about... So you're, you're talking, it's like a conservation of flexibility. Like if in vertebrates, which tend to have more software control... Um, there might be less flexibility in the hardware side. In, it's a lot in this easier. case, the Hox genes. It's a lot easier to produce a vertebrate that cannot figure out how to walk rather than, you know, I'm, I'm thinking by analogy, um, I think I pointed some weeks ago to Vihart's analysis of mm -hmm. Fibonacci sequences in yeah. plants. And the basic point was nowhere in the plants is there a description of a Fibonacci sequence. What right. there is is a set of simple rules that results in Fibonacci sequences that basically serve 
to get the leaves out of each other's shadow. So as you change the form of a plant, you get a slight modification of where the leaves come out, but basically they're repelled, they're chemically repelled from the last, from all the other leaves in such a way that distributes them so that they fill in whatever structure you've got. And so the mm -hmm. basic point is you've got a system that as you change the structure of a plant, distributes the leaves in some useful way. And I'm imagining that there might be something similar where as you um, add legs, there's some mechanism for figuring out how to coordinate them and that this would be much harder to do in vertebrates. Therefore, a conservation where mm -hmm. the way to locomote is a variation on a known theme yeah, yeah. rather than a rapidly expanding combinatorics problem yeah. might might be the... Well, there's also, it's, it's very rare in vertebrates um, to be able to regenerate limbs or digits it's mm -hmm. it it is it, it exists in some in i think a couple of different salamander clades we have in fact had yes we so salamanders. for sure one salamander clade but i think it's actually more than one salamander clade so actually multiple i, I think I the think evidence suggests just be one if i'm recalling correctly well I, I i think there may be multiple evolutions of of this capacity but it is it is restricted to i think caudates to to salamanders within um at least within the tetrapods, and I think maybe within the vertebrates more broadly. Whereas um, everything about arthropods seems sort of more segmented. Like you know, you everyone has seen like harvest men, which aren't spiders but are related to spiders, daddy long legs, um, having lost a leg and still moving around fine. Sometimes us three, four, five legs even, right? And they yeah. still they still do fine. They don't, you know, there's no need to staunch the bleeding. They just like it happens. Um, and vertebrates don't do nearly as good a job of sealing off things when they lose a th when they lose something. Well, there's a question about where this comes from, though, because okay. um, so. We have noticed many times in the tropics when you're when you're at a field station that has some sort of lights that stay on all night, they act as an inadvertent light trap. And so right. especially if you lodge somewhere where you pass the same wall every night, you get a kind of a sense of who's coming out of the forest. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how frequently you encounter animals that are missing a limb mm -hmm. and still functioning. But it's all insects and arachnids. Right. Mm -hmm. But the point is, all right, these are creatures that don't have meaningful capacity for repair at all right and so there's a question what does selection see when it, uh, you know a spider has lost a limb right it has no process by which to give up and fairly frequently mm -hmm. a spider who has lost a limb and manages will reproduce so but that maybe it's capacity for repair that is the, the sort of causal agent that we're looking for rather than external versus internal skeleton it's exactly where i was going oh. my point is going to be in the vertebrates we see the repair capacity tracking the viability of the creature in repair and post repair. Mm -hmm. So we see it, I think we've mentioned this recently, we see it in things like sloths, which fall out of trees and break a limb. And because they're not just a tree limb, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, they, because their ecology does not depend on them dodging predators through stealth or through speed. <laughs> Um, yep. you can actually get away with being a, a, a sloth with a bum limb mm -hmm. um, and survive through crypsis, which is the basic way that they avoid being eaten. So the point is there have been lots and lots of sloths that have broken a limb and then gone on to reproduce. So there's lots of capacity to repair. Yep. Monkeys similarly and us, right? Mm -hmm. We have lots of capacity for that kind of repair, but loss of limb, how often? And so the point is, why is this capacity not augmented, the capacity to replace a limb? It, I see one of two paths. One, limb loss is so devastating that you don't tend to survive it and leave offspring in the ancestral environment. And the other, which leans more in the direction of, of my initial response here, is that we have to learn to use our limbs. Mm -hmm. And so if you replaced a limb, it, it's not automatically clear that it would be so useful, just the same way as a blind a person who's been blind since birth, who suddenly gets sight, doesn't necessarily know what to do with the information that there's, that's coming in their eyes because they didn't go mm -hmm. through the developmental process that would teach them how to deal with it. So, you know, is the reason that we can't regenerate our limbs because it's biologically impossible to create that? 
or is it that it just has not been useful? So in the same way that a horse yeah. doesn't have the capacity to repair a broken leg very easily because very few horses in the ancestral past ever survived a broken leg because they would get picked off by whatever predators were present, it just never got augmented. Yeah, and I guess so not appendicular skeleton, but returning to axial skeleton, limb regeneration is very rare. And let's just stick to tetrapods because I'm just less sure about the um, aquatic vertebrates, <clears throat> the, the primarily aquatic vertebrates, ones that didn't return secondarily. Um, but um, along the axial skeleton, caudal autotomy, which is fancy language for um, tail loss and regrowth, mm -hmm. is actually fairly common uh -huh. in the um, in the squamates, yeah. right, which is the lizards and, and snakes, um, where, and in, in fact, there, there are definitely, in this case, different evolutions of caudal autotomy, because in some cases, it's intervertebral. In some cases, the when you know, a predator bites the tail, it's adaptively advantageous to drop the tail and they leave, leave the tail moving while you escape and the predators have got a mouthful the tail, sometimes that break happens between the vertebrae, intervertebrally, and sometimes it's intravertebrally. Um, sometimes it's actually, it breaks a vertebra in half. Yep. Really? Uh, mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that. clearly different, different yes, evolutions, different evolutions yeah. of, of caudal autotomy, which um, if you're, if you're a yummy little lizard um, or a snake, uh, there are, there are apparently many clades in which um, that was an adaptive all right. Thank you. Yeah. My, my uh -oh. ignorance is about to come to the surface here. I uh, would have said that there are no snakes that have caudal autotomy. Are you telling me mm, that there are any? Yeah. As I was saying, I was like, I, I, I think there, I think there are snakes, but I'm not, I'm not positive. Uh, and, and you know, why? So I, I have this, I have a sense of like why there might not be. You probably have a sense of why there might, or are you just saying I've, I've never seen it? Yeah. Uh, my sense is locomotory wise. It, you know, loss of a tail um, is a big deal no matter who you are if you had a tail. Yeah. Um, but for a snake, it's an even bigger deal because you're using, um, you know, depending, there's like these five modes of locomotion in snakes. But regardless, you're using your body on the ground to some degree and your tail's part of that body on the ground. And so yeah. lose your tail and you may actually um, be, be really incapable of getting around for a while after that. Yeah, although you could... I mean, I don't see any reason that it shouldn't work, but I think the reason I guess I'm not expecting it mm -hmm. is the way snakes are preyed upon may not make it all that useful, right? In other words, if you're <clears throat> jumping at a lizard mm -hmm. and the lizard is escaping, it's not uncommon that you end up with its tail and yeah. it drops the tail. And I'm thinking that might not be the case with snakes, that the way... A predator goes after a snake. A very quick search reveals the Russian Journal of Herpetology mm -hmm. uh, from 1994. Uh, caudal autotomy in the colubrid snake Xenocrophus piscator, no, piscator, from Vietnam. Uh, the abstract, uh, which is not extensive. A rare case of caudal autotomy in a colubrid snake from Vietnam is described. It is an intervertebral autotomy that differs from the more commonly encountered intravertebral autotomy, typical of most lizard species. Distribution and origin of intervertebral autotomy in squamates are discussed. So, now, does it say anything there about some predator that would then validate the a uh, trickier part of the hypothesis I just put forward? Um, yeah, I, I do not have the rights to the full uh, paper at the Russian Journal of Herpetology. I'll have to, you know, try to sci-hub this later or something. So but all at the moment, have, I'll, I'll have these abstract and the references. All the you title. have is the abstract, which, which is like two you, sentences long. gives you Russian to conclusions, which in a scientific paper are up front in the abstract. They are. Yes. Russian yep, to no, conclusions. Like I'm right there. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Not overwhelmed with the humor, but not, not no. Okay. Been a rough week. Yeah. Yeah.